Amen, 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 amen. Come on in, Facebook. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, amen, amen. Just give me a time for you all to connect. This is the Brinson Connection, and I am your host, Apostle Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson III. Amen. Another week, another time of sharing what God is doing in the land, in the earth, and the principles of the word. Amen. We're giving some time for some of you all to connect in with us. Uh, those of you that are coming on, amen. We just come on in, come on in, come on in, come on. Thank you for all of those who have been making contact with us and watching our programs. Those of you that have joined us and um, on our YouTube page and subscribe, and you are actually going into our YouTube page, our YouTube channel, uh, go to YouTube and uh, search bar Dr. Sylvester Brinson III and Go in there and watch some of our teachings and join and subscribe to our channel. We thank God for those persons who have been doing that and watching our program. Mm -hmm. It's exciting what God is doing and uh, happy. God bless you, Elder Marvin. Trust all is well. We had a great time in the Sunday school lesson today. So many things were talked about and discussed. Uh, well, I want... Uh, those that are watching us this week, I don't know, I had a problem um, downloading uh, uh, last week's uh, presentation to my YouTube uh, channel. However, it's in it's on Facebook, so if you missed last week, you can just on Facebook and go back down and, sc and scroll our page and pick it up. But I want to continue part two. We last week, we last week, we... We're talking about observations from the story of Zacharias. Those of us uh, that uh, are part of this process know that we also follow the International Sunday School lesson. And sometime I will teach and share excerpts from the Sunday School lesson in as much as we do the Sunday School lesson every Wednesday from 1030 to 12 on our free conference call line. So if you want to get that information, you can scroll down off of this, go to our page and scroll down and see the flyer and get the number and the code and join us every Wednesday, Central Standard Time, Chicago time from 1030 to 12. For you that are studying the Sunday School lesson, we meet with some of our leaders and some of our commentaries and we talk, we talk, we talk and share. And so uh, we've been doing that. And then from time to time, we just might share what God is doing in the land. So this is the Brinson Connection. And every Wednesday at uh, 2 o'clock hour Central Standard Time, Chicago time, coming from Chicago, the suburbs of Chicago, the state of Illinois, and the country, United States of America, all of my Facebook friends all over the world, I greet you wherever we've been watched. I greet you in the name of him, who said, I am the resurrection. I greet you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and our Lord. Brother Eugene, God bless you, Elder Marvin. God bless you. Well, I want to, um, you all need to read, uh, look at part one. I want to look at part two. I want to look at some observations from the story of Zacharias taken from the Gospel of St. Luke chapter one. So many, so many, so many, so many, so many people talk about uh, this is the Christmas season, and this is the season, and we talk about Jesus. There are other things that are surrounded, other stories of Mary and Elizabeth and Zacharias and John the Baptist. And so I want to I wanna just say some more things um, about observations and principles from uh, the story relating to Elizabeth, Zacchaeus, John the Baptist, and Mary. Uh, go to chapter St. Luke chapter 1, St. Luke chapter 1. And uh, out of that that story, we want to uh, look at some additional things. Well, last week, we talked about Elizabeth being barren. And we talked about the psychosocial dimensions uh, and the things that went along with a 
a husband, a priest, a husband, period, in the Jewish community, if you was married, if you got married and you could not have a child and you were barren, you were considered as something was wrong with you or you were considered as being punished by God. The people looked down upon you. The, the, your husband's family looked down upon you. Your family looked down upon you. The women in the community looked down on you. The community people looked down on you because it was believed then traditionally that when you come together and get married, one of the main things was to have offspring, to have children. And one of the primary things was not only to have children, to have a son, at least a son, because as I was back in those days, it was out of the male seed that carried the legacy and the generational wealth of the family. So it was uh, always known that young ladies always, when they look forward to being married and young men, was to have a family and raise some children, but at the same time have a son. At least you know, one son, a son, or sons that would carry the tradition of the family uh, and futuristic to perform legacy. So here is a high priest uh, that is married. And his wife, or we want to say, God bless you, Pastor Elder. We want to say first, first lady uh, Zacharias, first lady uh, Elizabeth. She was barren. They had prayed and asked God for a child. Evidently, uh, nothing happened. So here she's uh, in old age now. And so you know how we are. We tend to we pray for things and we ask God for things, and then. Uh, when certain situations arise that it doesn't make sense, we just kind of like, you know, stop asking and we move on to something else. We take our hope and we recharge our hope and move it into another direction. So if Zacharias and Elizabeth had been praying and asking God for a son, now at the age of, at the age they were, and Zacharias responds to Gabriel, the angel, his wife is not old, but not only old, but very old. Wow. And and so so now there's some discussions about a prayer that had been prayed some time ago. And so we talked about that and what that meant in the story. So now I want to segue a little bit in the story because uh, while Elizabeth is now conceived now, it said, and she conceived. One of the things that I have read and sometimes I've overlooked it, you know how you know how you grew up in church and you go to Sunday school and you read the Sunday school book and you listen to the preachers and you listen to sermons and then you go back and you start studying the scripture yourself. Then you realize that certain parts of the scripture that you read were skipped over. Or it was alluded to in passing, but not really dealt with specifically. And out of that small portion of scripture, one verse, two verses, three sentences, God gives you a rhyme of word. There's a revelation of God's word that comes into your experience that stands out in the story or the narrative of the text. That's why I like so much, no matter how much you know about God's word and how much you read God's word. I guarantee you that every now and then there will be a rain of revelation of God's revealed word from his word. As you study the word of God, read the stories and the narratives and the themes, sometimes you come across a statement, just a statement or two or three sentences or a story that has a profound effect on where you are, what you see, what you experience, what you go through, what you, what, what's, what's going on in your life or what's in your process and how you see that as you engage others in what we call this life called the journey of life. And so I want to read this verse here, uh, St. Luke chapter one, and I was looking at it and it said, um, uh, after Zach Zacharias, um, he goes home. And it said, verse 21, and the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. When Zacharias, Zach, when you coming out of the temple, you go in at the altar, altar of incense and it normally don't take that long. You in there kind of long now. What's going on in there? And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, 
he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. All right. So, 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 so Andre, so, so while he comes out doing the offering of incense and you all that want to get some more information, go to about part one. We're looking at part two. He waves it up and it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, when he finished serving his time, now can you imagine the rest of his time to serve? He is deaf and dumb. He can't hear, can't speak because of what took place in the temple. So he's got to still serve out his time. And um, it says, and it came to pass that as soon as the days of his main ministrations were accomplished, he departed to his own house. He went home after serving in the temple, serving in the ministry, whatever his assignment was as a priest, he went home. It said, and after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. This is the part I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, this verse. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself for five months saying, thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. God has smiled on me. And because I can see this, the text says she hid herself five months. Now, you know, women, I need your help now. You know, you, you know more about uh, this pregnancy thing than I do. I have three, three children and, uh, uh, I'm familiar. I was old as a 14, so I'm familiar with the whole pregnancy situation. Now, here is an elder woman that is first lady in her priestly group of priests. All the priests, all the priests that were married, they was like they were first ladies. So Lady Zaki, whatever Zachariah's last name was, she was his lady. She was of high position in the temple and the places, but yet out of the ladies that were there gathered, she was barren. Nothing like peer pressure, nothing like peer pressure. First lady can't have no children. She's married to the preacher. She's married to the priest. And back in those days, the culture says that if you are married and become a wife and you don't have any children, God is not smiling on you. Something is wrong with you and God does not heed or respect your prayers and your the family is looked down upon. Your family looks at you, your brothers and your sisters, your cousins, your friends, and the person that you married, family looks down upon you and the community at large. So now in the midst of all of that, God comes in and say, hey, you're going to get pregnant. In your senior years, and she gets pregnant. So now it seems to me, now God already had interrupted with Zacharias and told him, see, I'm going to you're going to have to be quiet. I'm going to shut your mouth until the manifestation of time. When your son is born, you shall have a son. Don't call his name John. And you want to know how that's going to be. So you questioning me. So before you talk yourself out of a blessing, I'm going to shut your mouth. I'm, you, you're not going, I'm not going to let you talk. Does God do that to us sometimes? We'll find ourselves in situations and our culture among our family and the friends and expectations. And then God shares with you, he's about to bring you out. He's about to change your situation. He's about to do something for you. And you like, I can't believe it. And then sometime in the midst of your blessing or the midst of your beginning process, you talk down your process to other people. I know what the Lord said and I know, but I don't know how that's going to happen I, Brinson, I know the Lord is good. I know he's a way maker, but based upon what I'm going through, I just don't see no way out. You're going to have to actually pray. So we have a tendency. Some of us, we defeat our own purpose. We talk our own selves out of a blessing. So that, so that the providential uh, will of God may go forth. God said, you know what? I'm going to shut your mouth. You're not going to be able to speak until the season of come. When your child is born and the right season has come, then you'll be 
you'll, you, you'll be able to go back into your communication process. But right now, you are going to be blind for a season. You're not hearing nothing and you're not going to be able to say nothing. Ah, that's something. I got to quiet you. I want you, I just want you to be quiet. Now, Elizabeth comes through the same process and she says she goes away five months. Uh, I'm told that uh, the pregnancy, a pregnancy, the first trimester is very important uh, for some women, you know, you know, they, they have to be careful when they're just, you know, that they don't lose the child in the first trimester. You know, some of them are told to stay off their feet, watch their diet, be careful what they do. Now, here's an older woman who never been pregnant before. She's over the age of conception, but yet in the same time, the Holy Spirit deals with her. And in dealing with her, he gives us some guidance and some sense of things. And she goes in for five months to just be out away from people or out away from influences. But they tell me that even, you know, how you think, what you do, what you say, who talks to you, all that has something to do indirectly with the child that you are carrying. That's why you have to be very sensitive. Women who are pregnant, they have to be careful what they say, where they go, what they hear, because a lot of the development process of the fetus takes on some of the pain, negativity, as well as the joys and happiness of the parent that carries the child. In the DNA and personality is developed also by what that mother goes through in her frame of mind, whether it was her fault or not. It is just the way she carried the child, her attitude, her surroundings, or what she ate, her diet, all that has something to do with the development of the child. So in God's process, he knew that John had to be developed a certain way. And he knew that from some years now, Elizabeth had been abused socially and psychologically and probably most likely economically because she had to deal with the fact that she was a married woman to a married man that was not fertile, uh, that was fertile, but she was barren. So that means for them to conclude that she was barren means that he had to be trying to have a child, but yet couldn't have one. And that was a negative in the community. So she was talked about community. So you have to understand that a community will either talk about you negative or talk about you positive, but there's still a communication of publicity on you in the community that also can affect you, how you feel, how you relate, and what you do. So when God changed the process, the cultural expectations, then what happens? She's smart enough to be dealt with by the Holy Spirit to hide herself. To go into hiding, not hang out. Girl, you pregnant? What you doing? What's that? I got to explain the bump. Well, see, you know, I'm pregnant. And so her friends was like, get out of it. Come on, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you pregnant, Elizabeth? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, do you know how old you are, Elizabeth? What you been drinking? What you been smoking, Elizabeth? Do you say what? And your husband, and that's why he deaf and dumb. No, he got a nervous breakdown or something. Y'all jacked up. You know, you don't know all the kinds of things and dynamics that could have occurred with Elizabeth when she was first uh, became, when she first moved into, this, into her conception and became pregnant. The capacity to be led by the Holy Spirit to protect that which is in you and let it grow and be nurtured before you release it out. So that's a principle. That's a principle that I gather just from that, to be able to make the right contacts and do the right things and get the right connections to be ready to do what needs to be done in relationship of you obeying God's will. And so, well, so now when the story in, in Luke chapter one segues over to Mary and, and Gabriel comes to Mary and tell Mary that uh, your cousin is pregnant. Mary, 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 why are you pondering in your mind as a teenager 
that you are just engaged to a young man, you all not intimate, sexually intimate yet, uh, that you're going to have a child by the Holy Spirit. And there's a certain way that uh, this child is going to be named and everything because the angel told you that this child was coming and what it was going to do. Okay, but you don't know nobody. Like that, you, you, you. So, how are you gonna get pregnant? So, we got this whole pregnancy issue with Mary, betrothed to Joseph, but not intimate, but told that the host of most high is gonna come overshadow her. And then you got her cousin Elizabeth, who was too old to have children, according to cultural norms and medical science, that's telling her that she's pregnant by her husband with his old self. She pregnant by him, huh? And so she goes in seclusion only to have her cousin Elizabeth to visit her because the angel said, your cousin Elizabeth is with child in the sixth month. Your, your cousin is six months pregnant. The angel told Mary that. So Mary gets up and the hill and country and go to visit her cousin to try to find out what's going on. And when she steps in the room, so visiting uh, John the Baptist as a little boy, hears, hears the words of his auntie to be. He ain't even born yet. He hears the word of his auntie, cousin, cousin, auntie, or cousin, however you want to call it. And he leaps in the womb and the womb carrier was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a principle. God will anoint those persons that are part of the story plan. So if God has a will for your life and a will for your life and you have purpose or you know purpose or you're not sure about purpose, if you put it all in God's hand and be on the standby, you will leave being purposed. So as we look at this story today, Zachariah is at home. He's deaf, dumb, mute. Uh, it happened right after he came home from church. As you all say, he had a stroke where to come home from church. And now he's gone through all these months where he cannot read or write. That, But he cannot, I, no, I'm going to take that back. He cannot speak or hear. He's deaf and dumb. So much going through his mind, so much things he see. You know, and out of his past, he was a priest. So that means he knew how to talk. He knew how to lead praise and worship and all that. Now imagine what his sound would be like. So here we are. So Elizabeth is sanctified, received the Holy Spirit. While her child in the womb leaps in the womb. And what was in Mary connected to what was in Elizabeth, regardless of the age group. And God began to do some things. And as a result, down through the years, he has continued to show his mercy and his love, specifically by going to the cross and dying for our sins and saying, whosoever will let him come. Let me be your Lord and Savior. So now, and have birthed out what we call the church. But let's look at why, how... God's word does not return into him void. If he says something, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Regardless of how it needs to do, it's going to happen. Now, you know, we're now amazed like I am when I read the details of the story. Don't, you know, well, Brent is just good enough to know that, uh, hallelujah, that, that, that Mark, that Elizabeth was uh, barren. She couldn't have no kids. God spoke to her husband. He questioned them. The angel, he questioned the angel Gabriel. Gabriel said, okay, you're not going to be able to hear speak until it happens. And so he's at home doing what he got to do, waiting for that child to be born. And Elizabeth is saying, ah, I now feel like, oh, I see this. I, 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 am, I am pregnant now. And so I want to get away from here around my people and my kindred that know me. And I want to go somewhere else and stay away for a while. Sometime the breakaway 
from your general activities is healthy for you. For instance, how is that healthy? No, it's healthy. It's healthy. So Elizabeth is using for those of you that are psycho, psychosocial, mental health and wellness coaches, you know, sometimes you need to step away from something so that something else can grow. You need to step away from something so that whatever's going on with that, per, those other people, they can find their, their niche because you could be blocking their niche and not intentionally, but it could be just because it is. And so rather than uh, God allowing you to, to reap the benefits of their intimidation or whatever, he'll just move you over here, change your this over there and say, you know, take a leave of absence over here and don't even come around for a while because uh, you know that can do it so much criticism. So I need you to, you know, do you, just do you. But keep in mind as you do that, that uh, I want you a certain uh, uh, to be sanctified aside. God dealt with her. This is this your mercy. God's mercy said as your age. At your age, if we was going to do anything, we should have did it earlier. But at your age, you're going to have some issues. Can you imagine a baby crying? They didn't say that John the Baptist was a good baby. Can you imagine at your age raising up a young man, you and Zach? Can you imagine being in the culture of a P, being a PK or a priest kid? We are all, we got issues now. My sons, two sons, or they sometimes they be mad. Brinson, when you was pastor, you didn't give us no time. You just love the church, love the church. There are a lot of ministers and ministries. You you can't do nothing without your church. And 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 then and then it's like there's a expectation of the church for you to always be there and be around. So so it's somewhat similar to this story and narrative with Zacharias and his wife by him being one of the many priests now. And he's in there doing religious duties, and now he's turned it over, uh, and uh, he's going back home with his wife. And then she hears from God, and based upon God talking to her and the mercies and grace and whatever else God said, because Luke doesn't stand around to deal to give the details, but whatever was said, however whatever was communicated, she was restored back into her proposition situation. And so we see the story now with uh, they're at the table and uh, Lazarus, not Lazarus, but uh, Zacharias and all of those people are raising the issue and the question now, uh, what's going on? Because she's pregnant and been pregnant, even though she had been in hiding for a while, she's out. And wow, what you say the date was, and it was in great anticipation for that child to be born. I, you know, I don't need to stay on a whole hour, but I just wanted to kind of come on to give some more nuggets to add this part two to my part one earlier, Professor Schaefer, uh, Sister M Lady Lady Hodges, uh, the uh, 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 Prophet Dr. Jack Carter, because I wanted us to see that sometime in the midst of culture and norms, God's directive is in conflict with what the status quo believes, see, feel, or sense. So within the culture, I've made some notes in, in, in some of my study books, but it was just something to me as I, you know, I read the commentaries on the lesson. And, and so one of the things that stood out to me was uh, mm. now, 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 now. One of the things that stood out to me was now that we, now that the child is being, has been born, now they're in eight days process, they're going to have the baby circumcised and named. The baby's going to be circumcised and named. In the midst of the baby being circumcised and named, the father is not able to still to speak. And so the culture, it says, and when her time was come, note this. She hid herself five months. In that process of hiding herself 
five months. Coming out of the five months, I, I would try to put some time frame on it because Gabriel comes to Mary. And when Gabriel tells Mary that she was going to be with child, Gabriel says, and your cousin is in her sixth month. So when uh, uh, Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, her cousin, to tell her the news, the baby leaves and she's filled with the Holy Ghost, but she's in her six months of pregnancy. Now, it didn't say, Luke did not say specifically when she went into a five-month uh, hiatus. Because she, after God had spoken to her and showed her mercy, it said she went into five months. So did she go in uh, after she was three or four months pregnant and went into five months and then she had the delivery of the child? Or did she go in when she became pregnant for five months and then after the five months kind of come out and, and was around the, around the 10 waiting to be delivered? It, it didn't say specifically. It just says that five, in five months of her process, she, you know, stepped aside and kind of stayed out of the full view. Sometimes you have to do that. Sometime in your process, when God is meeting the need of celebrating you and putting you in certain positions or something, you may need to take some sabbatical time out from the day-to-day -day activities, everybody's opinion, what folk got to say, you know, because it kind of can mess things up. So you got to be careful that even be, I'm told, even for women that are pregnant, it's been said that, you know, the first trimester is important, you know, and there's, uh, you know, you have to be careful what you say, who you say, your diet, what you do, you know, because it all affects things. So, so whatever the Holy Spirit did after it came up on uh, Elizabeth and she uh, uh, received the Holy Spirit later on, God began to deal with her and she absent herself for five months. Now, after that time, the word is getting out, oh, time has come. She didn't have the baby. So what happens? The cousins, it said her cousins and her friends came to celebrate. Them same cousins and friends, I bet you was the same ones that, as we say, dogged her out. I bet you. I bet you. If, if, if the culture said, if you was married and you was a wife and you could not produce children and you were barren, then there was a curse or you something was wrong. God did not favor you. And it says that the family, uh, the families on both sides and the community kind of put you out. Now, what, how, what does God do? He orchestrates a process by which he brings a community of people, your cousins and others that had some issues about your issue before he rearranged them, Sister Brenda. And now they come to celebrate. Uh, the, almost the same group that talked about that 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 had you feeling bad that you might have to take some time and separate you, yourself from. They're coming now to celebrate because they heard what God has done. There's nothing like a payback of the Holy Spirit. Oh, the feeling! Some of you all are listening to me now and watching me. You have that testimony. You know, they dogged you out. They talked about you. You could talk about the psycho, psychological uh, dimension of how you felt about those things, the sociological and economical dy dynamics that affected your finances and your geographical mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. You can talk about how you felt because of those situations. You can talk about that and because they are real. But, oh, when your time has come, and God begins to break through and, and begins to do with you. His mercy comes in in the midst of your stuff. And he begins to do things and restrain, re rearrange what you have mm -hmm. gone through. And rearrange other things in your life. What happens? What happens to you then? Wow. It changes all of a sudden. You know, people are funny. They'll talk about you and put you down. And if something happened, they'll turn around and start smiling. And you be like, you too wasted. This is the nature of the crowd, the nature of the crowd. So this crowd, they're back at the house now. And the culture saying, the people who represents the culture and the tradition saying, you know, it's going to be circumcised. We're having this big celebration. Are you coming to the circumcision? Are you coming to the celebration? In fact, we decided we're going to name them at the celebration. And there's no historical tradition that says that a male child had to be named at the circumcision. Uh, in those days, you know, perhaps they just probably decided at the circumcision they were going to name them. 
could have been because Luke and none of the scriptures say that a male child had to be named at the eighth day. It would say at the eighth day, the male child was to be circumcised on the eighth day. It didn't say you had to have a name, but they decided, you know, to name them and everything. So now what does the culture and the cousins and the aunties and everything, they, now they want to get into it. Now they, they want to dictate now. Now all this other time you was believing God and going through your situation and they was, you know, scratching their head about how could this be? But now that it is, now they want to jump in and take the lead, dictate and say what needs to happen. You, you got people like that in your life. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. We all do. Now they, they want to all of a sudden that they on board now, they want to dictate the process. So we need to name him. We're going to name him Zacharias. It's going to be not nice. Zacharias Jr. Whatever. You know, we're going to. But say, no, 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 no. What you mean, John? Nobody in your family named John. You know, culturally, traditionally, he's the first son. He should be named after his father to keep the heritage. Or if he's not named after his father, he's named after one of the men. It was customary that a male child be named after his father or from one of the men in the family, be it brother, uncle, grandfather, whatever, as long as that male child was named carry one of the names of a person in the culture or the tribe or the group. That was like what it was expected. Now, so John, nobody got the name of John. But but Gabriel had told Zacharias his name shall be called John. And then told him he's going to shut your mouth. I'm sure because Zacharias probably earlier said, well, you know, yeah, I had a vision. I don't know because this angel couldn't have been of God because he came and told me that I was going to have a son and name him John. I don't know about that, naming him John. If anything, if I'm going to have a son, he's going to be named Zach Jr. Hey, I mean, you know, why he got to be named John? So that's why, you know, I'm, you can't say nothing. I'm going to let you be quiet. I'm going to mute you. I, I, you don't get no two cents. If you got to say anything, you have to put it in writing. You got to write stuff down because I want you to understand this is going to happen. This, God says, his word, he hastened his word to perform it. I don't care what happens, what people say. I don't care what folk try to do. I don't care what the culture is. I don't care what the tradition is. If God said it and proposed it, it shall happen. His sovereign will happens. Sovereign will happens. God is in control. Everything is overturned and rearranged in keeping with where God is taking the process. So the process or whatever happens in the process is directly related to the obedience of the person participating. But be it known unto you, whatever God has said, your process is going to begin to react to the directive of which God's words say you will be. So if you are disobedient, then guess what? And your process is going to be the payback. Your pro Look at your process right now. What are you going through? How? Well, God told me so and 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 so. So the question is, what are you doing about what God said? Because your process and moving you toward what God said is going to be direct related to your obedience, your consciousness of understanding. So if God said he was going to bless you with houses and lands and you in bankruptcy or you don't take care of nothing, and every time you get, you get a little paycheck, you spend it. Well, then God has to rearrange that process in you to learn how to be more steward, to steward your money, steward your time, steward your things. So as he begins to take his time to work that out in you, that becomes a part of your process because your isness and your shall be to become is directly related to his purpose. So God works out things and make us uh, applicable to his purpose through the process. So the process of Zechariah was, you're dumb. You're going to be dumb for a season, okay? And all the things that go along with a priest being dumb, <laughs> a dumb preacher. You, you, you're a preacher, you're a priest. Your job is to minister, you know, when you get your chance to minister, okay, well, so many, but you're still a priest. You wear the title, you the rev, you the dude. Have you seen a man of God that's a minister or a priest that can't talk? Now, that's got to be very frustrating. You communicate by by written. That's way back two thousand years ago. Can't talk. People come to get a word. No counseling. You no know, no 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 no. He can't talk. Why? Because he saw a vision. And so then you got to go. You get other people have to explain. Isn't it frustrating when other people try to explain your situation? 
You don't want other people trying to explain you because they always, you know, change some of the sense tax. They change the direction. They add stuff to it. They get it all confused. No, no. You like to tell your own story. And then when people tell your story, if you listen to them, you're going to have to amend it because they're going to add their stuff to it and all that stuff. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Come on. Yes, they do. You tell a person what God did and the next thing you do in your story and how it happened and all that, and you hear it again, is somebody to add something to it. They didn't change it around. So just imagine being dumb and you can't talk. So the process Zach, Zacharias had to go through, then his wife, she said, well, you know, I'm, sm you know, I'm, a, you know, Five for five months, I'm just gonna chill out. I'm gonna be out there. Uh, Bay, I need you to go to the market. Normally, I go to the market uh, certain times. I need you to go. Why? I don't want. I'm not going to the market. I'm gonna cut back my routines of being in the public for a while because God has dealt with me and He's dealing with me, and I need to hear Him because something about this child is proper, and I need to know how to raise it. I need to know how to train it up in the way it should go. I need more be sensitive. Sometimes we ain't everybody's stuff. But ours. I'm learning that too. So sometime I have to be, I have to take the principle of Elizabeth. I need to take a five month sabbatical. You know how they do, you know, in the media world and others, you know, certain songwriters and certain musicians and certain authors, they, they take a sabbatical leave and they don't say nothing. You ain't hear from about a year, two years, six months, whatever. And all of a sudden they going on a tour. Or they're coming to a city. Or they back. And so everybody's coming because they ain't heard them for a while. They want to see where they are. The anticipation of something new is on the horizon now. And folk want to see the pause. The, 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 the creative pause. Or a divine pause. Sometimes God will put a divine pause in your life. And tell you to come away for a time with him. To re-show you to your world, to re-show you to your cousins, to re-show you to your community. But he took you out a while to remake you, to remold you, to strengthen you, to get you in another kind of a focus. And then allow you back in for the newness and the new direction that you come. So Elizabeth is coming back in and she's had this child now. And folk is talking about, we're going to name it Zacchaeus. Cause I mean, that's not Zach kids. I'm said we're going to, we, we're going to name Zariah. We're going to name it Zach. Zachariah. We're going to name it Zachariah because that's what we're supposed to do. And she said, no, his name's got to be John. So as she goes through that, okay, well let's, okay, do the sign language and ask John, you know, so when John writes down on the paper, his name is John. A wonder happened. His mouth is open. So God kept you in a situation until the fullness of time had come and you were able to verify to others what God said. Then God released you. And I wanted, so everybody's wild. Now we know this, this we, we know that he couldn't talk. So now what did God do? God sets the stage of your promotion. God, God is like a media consultant. He, he gets your your media stuff together because now when you say and confirm that God said his name is John, your mouth is open. And so that's going to jump out. And people say, did you see that? The minute he named him, you his mouth. Wow. So the word went out. It said, and it went out through the whole hill country. Now it had already been out that this old woman was having a baby. It had got out there through the gossip channels, through the media channels, that, you know, old sister Elizabeth, very old, is pregnant now. She said nine months, she hadn't been. Now, that was already uh, that was already out there, overseer. Overseer died. That was already over. That was already there, sister Brenda. So now, here's this old lady, this older woman, ha coming out of seclusion, having a baby. Her husband is a priest. He can't talk. He's mute. They're making sign language. They confirm that his name is John against the status quo of the culture. His mouth is opened and he can talk now. Fear it grips everybody in the room. All the cousins, all the friends, everybody has something to say. You know, when God shows up and give a sign, it shuts down those people who are around you. So every now and then, some of you all have had those experiences, you know, where God said certain things. He showed you certain things, certain people, whether it's your wife or your husband, or your friend, or just somebody, or just you by yourself, God takes you through a process to believe him, and wait on him, and spite of, and then God shows up at the fullness of time, and it makes it happen, it happens, 
And with it happening, the way it happened is get to the point where people have to change their idea, their concepts, and they have to celebrate. And so they become your media presentation celebration. You ain't putting no flyers out. The word gets out. Just like the word went out on you negative, it got to go out positive. Always remember that a negative word out on you has to be going to have to be restructured by a positive word out on you. That's the way God did it. And it said, and fear fell on all of them. And everybody in the hill country, not only, not only did fear fall upon all of them, now John, little John, is in a situation because he's watched now. The people in the community, you know, you, you, you know, that's that little boy right there. You know, you, his mama had him when she was old. You, you, you know what else happened when she was carrying him? Her husband as a priest, uh, you know, he, he couldn't talk. He couldn't talk. But something about when he wrote the name down. On the day of, of him being circumcised, his mouth got open. Oh, really? Yeah, there he is. Oh, he's about 10 years old now. Yeah, we got to keep an eye on him. So God put you on blast. Some people is watching you because they heard something about you that's spectacular. It was something about you, uniquely about you, that when the devil tried to take you out and things got negative, somehow God in the magnitude of his power rearranged the storyline. So they're watching you. They're watching you. They're watching you. They're watching you. God set up your publicity team. You got your own paparazzi following you around, watching you. Watching you. Something about him. Something about him. He's special. Something about him. And so John the Baptist. We're going to talk about that probably next week, part three, because here's a young man that hears the word of the Lord, and he goes out to be a preacher at the age of around 20 years old. But I don't want to talk about that on this lesson. I want to talk about... Uh, how Zach, Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, the, the situations they found themselves in, the, the concepts of, of the community at large, the expectations of the culture, and the innuendos that family and friends had to play both negative and positive, all this self now is shifted in purpose process because God has said that this is what's going to happen, that a baby was to be born by an a, a older couple old man that said his wife was very, very old, so it wasn't about to happen. But it happened that she did conceive. It happened. Sign one, it happened. Sign two, I can't say nothing, but I'm going to go home. We're going to check this out. Go home. Can't say nothing. A mute, dumb brother, you know, becoming intimate with an old, old, old wife, and she conceives. Oh, oh, I, what I, 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 hey, I think I need to take five months off to try to figure this one out. And then in the sixth month of my pregnancy, my cousin comes to me and my baby leaps and I receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, some got out, you know, hey, hey, hey. So what, what, what more? The Holy Spirit comes upon you to give you power and strength and a sense of direction. No matter what you go through, no matter what the situations and the circumstances are, you must play along with the process of what God is doing. Well, I want to say play along with the process. Let me take that back because to put it like this, the process is the definition of how you play along. The process is actually what you are doing as a result of what God has said because whatever God is saying, he's doing. When God says something, he's doing something. His word would not return to him void, but it will accomplish that purpose which he sends. So God's word is always active, active, active word causes things to be. Causes things to be. Active word causes things to be. Yes, it causes things to be. Where is the active word? What active word have you received? And what are the causations of being? And the busyness of what things are happening in your life as a result of your understanding that what God said is going to happen. And if you didn't believe it, then God put you in a state to shut your mouth so you won't talk too much and talk yourself out of the blessing and bring two more. You know, you sometimes you can run your mouth so that you bring attention to yourself. And then when you're real wrong and now you got to try to explain yourself out. That's hard trying to explain yourself up out of a mess you created with your own mouth. So sometimes God don't let you talk certain places. He won't let you go. Well, I used to get invitations over here. I used to get invitations over there. I, 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 I used to get invitations here and over there and over here, but I don't get invitations no more. 
So God always confirms. He confirms. Thank you, uh, Professor Schaefer. He says Zachariah and Elizabeth's narrative parallels Abraham and Sarah. That's how God confirms in their minds that God was acting on their behalf. The parallel, yes, yes, Abraham and Sarah. The only thing about Sarah, she wanted to have, she, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to help God out. Hey, you, 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 you going to start helping God out? Well, the, welcome your activity to part of your process. In comes in your process now. You have to deal with Hagar. In your process, you're going to deal with the jealous woman. In your process, you have to deal with other things because you introduce to the process another activity of trying to help God out because sometimes we've heard from God and because of the situation we're in and where we are, we want to help God out. Now we're going to get in all in it. You know, so we said on, we said last week that, you know, maybe that's why God said to Zacharias, you're going to be done for a while because your position as a priest. And then you had clout because you was elected by your group to perform uh, the, the, the special sin offering. So you had some clout. You wouldn't know anybody. So you, we got to watch what you say. You know, one of the things that must is important that I've learned, based upon how people respect you, your level of anointing or whatever, you have to be careful what you say. You have to, you have to be careful what you say, how you say, and who you say what to. Because people will twist things or become offended. Folk are offended just being natural. They'd be offended that they was offended in Jesus and try to kill him. Throw him off the hill. John the Baptist, who prophesied that he was, that was his cousin, he was offended because he got locked up in jail and his cousin come see him. People get offended for all kinds of things. So you want to make, you want to be careful not to try to, in your mind, to help God out. This is what God said. So I believe God. Well, you know, I'm old. So Sarah, and she being old, she said, I know what we're going to do, Patricia. Uh, we're going to get a surrogate. Now, the difference between Sarah and Elizabeth was Elizabeth, two things happened to Elizabeth. She decided to go into seclusion for a while because she realized God had changed her definition in the eyes of her people when she conceived. Oh yeah. Number two, she had a verification that God was up to something because she experienced the baby leaping and she was filled with the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit in her was able to give her some guidance. And what she needed to do is now is be sensitive to greatest he that is in you than he that is in the world. Because she was filled with the Holy Ghost at six months in her pregnancy. It said nothing about uh, Sarah being getting the Holy Ghost. Sarah was talking about, is he going to make me laugh? Am I going to have pleasure? She, she, hey. But after you had your pleasure, hold it. you see, now you now you got to undo the whole thing with Hagar. So we have to be careful how we try to fix stuff because sometimes our process will command for us to unfix it, undo stuff, because we went ahead and not and didn't go according to what God said. So, you know, we we I just wanted to take some of that time out to uh, share with you uh from you know, some of part two. So this is uh, observations from the story of Zacharias part two. So when you go on, go on my Facebook page, look for the, the, the regular one observations from the story of Zachariah, and then look for the observations from the story of Zachariah part two. And that would be this lesson here. But I, you know, I just wanted to take some time to encourage you, to encourage you and to encourage you to understand that what God is saying Especially in this season, you you that are church leaders, those who are, are church participants, those who are members of the body of Christ, you know, pre-pandemic, mid-pandemic, post-pandemic. What is God saying? What, 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 what is happening with you? What is your story? What, in fact, is your story in the midst of other stories? The community has a story. The culture has a story. Your cousins and family have a story. But what's your story? What's going to be your story? How does how do their stories impact upon your story? You're the main theme of this. You're the main character in this story. Other people bring their stories to your story. So you don't want your story to become tainted by other people's stories. 
Let other people's stories become affected by your story. So in your story and what God is doing that becomes your history, stay focused. Stay focused on what God is doing in your life. Stay focused because your John the Baptist has been prophesied. It has been named. It has purpose. It has direction. And there are certain prices you are paying to carry your John the Baptist or to be a co-carrier of an idea, of a vision, or a dream. So what is it that God has for you in your life? So, you know, until next time, this has been your host, Apostle Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson III, coming all the way from the suburb of the city, the great international world city, Chicago, Illinois, and the state of Illinois, uh, and the country of the United States of America, all of you all over the world, my Facebook family all over the world, I greet you. This has been the Brinson Connection. I'm your host, Apostle Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson III. Meet us on next Wednesday, same time, same place, from 2 to 3. Every week, we'll be sharing something out of God's Word. We'll be sharing some bits of information. I'm, I really need to be talking about the election, but I... You know, maybe I'll come on on something else because I really got something to say about, ooh, gee, ooh, Lord. I, anyway, don't get me started. We we try to be holistic in our process, but on the present connection, I, I try to be nice. I try to be nice. I try to be nice. Okay, and so as we continue this season, remember Jesus is the reason for this Yuletide season. Always know that God is in control no matter what it looks like. Until next time, be blessed and highly favored by God to know that whatever God says, he will keep his promise.